Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our session today. I see there are still some people connecting, but I will uh, make a start nonetheless, and people can uh, catch up hopefully, and uh, we've got a lot to fit into today's session. So I just want to make sure we get through everything on time and we can all finish and enjoy our uh, weekends as well. So this session is uh, about engaging uh, clinicians enga engaging with the global environmental movement. Uh, my name is Aidan Long. I'm the Associate Director Engagement and Partnerships at Healthcare Without Harm Europe. And as many of you will know, we're a pan-European uh, network organization uh, made up of 151 uh, members across 33 different uh, European countries. And as well as our members, we work with uh, a number of different um, organizations and partner with different associations and health professional uh, bodies and associations as well. And I suppose what we wanted to do today for today's session is to uh, bring some of these organizations together to highlight some of the amazing work that's been done by clinicians uh, right across Europe um, to engage with this uh, global environmental movement. Um, there's a lot of uh, really amazing work being done in different countries, and we wanted to highlight three of those for you today. Also, at the end of the session, we will talk a little bit about our Doctors for Greener Healthcare uh, initiative, which we are just launching this week um, at Healthcare Without Harm. And if you're a health professional or um, uh, are working with health professionals and want to, I uh, suppose, engage with Healthcare Without Harm's work and join this uh, European movement, I uh, invite you all to join this network, and I'll have some information towards the end of the session about that. So as I said, we're highlighting three um, national initiatives in the session today. And uh, first of all, we're going to have um, uh, a session from the Irish Doctors for the Environment. And we'll be joined by Rachel and Anna, who will talk us uh, through their work in Ireland and um, the work they're doing to engage with and lead health professionals around planetary health um, uh, in the country there. We'll also hear from uh, Dr. Rita Issa from uh, Doctors for Extinction Rebellion, and uh, Rita is based in London. And then finally, for uh, today's session, we will hear from Reinhard, from Felix, and from Marlena, from um, uh, from the Club Network there, and all the amazing work uh, they're doing to engage with clinicians, particularly around the issue of uh, climate change. So before I uh, hand you over to, um, to Rachel and Anna to start the session today, I just wanted to highlight that at Healthcare Without Harm Europe, we are a nonprofit where um, uh, we have uh, funding from the European Commission and uh, some other trusts and foundations, but we do uh, rely on donations and support as well from our members and constituents. Um, this year, for the first year ever, we've been able to make Clean Med Europe free to attend. We're delighted to be able to do so. It's been a difficult year for everybody and bringing the uh, conference online has made it more accessible for everybody as well. And we really appreciate your support to be able to do this as well in the future. And uh, again, in lieu of a conference fee this year, we would ask that you or your uh, organization, if you could consider making a donation to Healthcare Without Harm Europe uh, to allow us to continue this uh, work, that would be really much appreciated. And you can find more information on the Clean Med Europe website. So cleanmedeurope.org forward slash support. And my colleague Maria will also drop that link into the chat on Whova for you all as well. So I suppose that's it in the way of introductions. What I'm going to ask now is I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Rachel McCann from Irish Doctors for the Environment to uh, share her screen and maybe kick us off by telling us about the amazing work you've been doing in Ireland. So Rachel, I'll hand it over to you, please. Super, thank you. So hello everyone um, and thank you so much for inviting myself and Anna to speak today. Um, my name's Rachel, I'm on a doctor currently working in Ireland in a Dublin um, uh, hospital and I'm the current operations officer for IDE. And I'm going to start off our joint session today just to talk about the work that Irish Doctors for the Environment have been doing and what our aims and objectives are and, and then Anna will continue to talk about and one particular aspect of that work which is our sustainable healthcare working group. 
So Irish Doctors for the Environment, or IDE, also has a lovely Irish term, um, IDE as Gaelica, which means thirst, which means thirst for goodness or knowledge. And this is a nice kind of setting for the ethos of what IDE does. St. Ida and St. Bridget are considered the most influential saints of early Irish Christianity and associated with education. And really this underpins what our main aim is. So in Irish Doctors for the Environment, our goal is to create awareness among healthcare workers, which will then inspire action and change. And the four pillars of the work we do surround change, advocacy, education, and science. So who are we and kind of what do the members of our group, you know, what backgrounds do they come from and, and, and what, what experiences do they have? And really one of the great opportunities that Irish Doctors of the Environment has is that our members come from all aspects of healthcare. So our members are consultants or not, um, junior doctors working in hospitals, uh, GPs, as well as uh, pharmacists, physiotherapists, um, scientists, um, and other MDT members of staff. And this is a picture from the Global Action Strike from last year. And this is one of our members who created this lovely hat. And so why doctors? Well, as we know from the Lancet countdown in 2015, they initially highlighted the role and the expanding role of physicians when it comes to climate change. Um, and it stressed that the response to the climate crisis is the responsibility of physicians. And this kind of led to the formation of the now known term planetary health. Um, and this is the understanding that human health and human civilization depends on our flourishing natural systems and the stewardship of those systems to succeed. And so as doctors, we're very obligated to speak out on what this Lancet has called the greatest global health th threat of our time. And it presents a new way to think of the health of human civilization. And that really underpins a lot of our drive and a lot of our direction from IDE. So again, climate change impacts human health, and this kind of changed the way we thought about our role when thinking about climate change. And as frontline workers, we will see some of the more initial impacts of climate change in years to come, even already. So we know that climate change from this report can impact about a quarter of a million deaths per year. Biodiversity loss has impacts on our food sources and systems, leading to undernutrition and can impact on the safety of our water use, as well as threatening the future of our soil degradation and ability to continue to um, uh, have uh, our current level of food production. And as described before, if the global healthcare was considered as a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter on the planet. And so it kind of, it stems the thought of then what can the healthcare system do as a whole? And it was really inspiring to see the announcement made by the NHS earlier this year and from before about their goal to deliver to net zero national health service. So it takes one person to really start driving a change. And it's very inspiring, inspiring to see that healthcare systems have been making these announcements um, and hopefully have a domino effect. And for us here in Ireland as well, it's a good uh, drive to try to see what aspects of change we can bring to our Irish healthcare system. More about Irish doctors for the environment then. So we are governed by our committee members, which currently hold 12 positions. And these oversee the work of 11 working groups that have our action and um, motivators on the ground. We're we are inspired by and get the advice from our consultant advisory board and these cover 17 specialities delivering a wealth of experience. We currently have 165 active members on our WhatsApp group um, and we have over 700 members on our mailing list for our monthly newsletter. So these are some of the members of our committee and this is our committee from 2020 to 21. Some lovely faces there and um, we have people who are involved in you know, media and press as well as our fundraising officer media officer and consultant advisory member Anna here as well. So our working groups cover a lot of the different goals and objectives that IDE want to do. So our active transport group was around encouraging people to travel by whatever means apart from cars, so such as walking and cycling to encourage not only active transport, but also better health. We also have a strong um, goal at the moment to include climate change in the medical curriculum. And the work that our members there have been doing have been speaking to all the different universities in Ireland to try to incorporate it into the different medical models that they have or to deliver the lectures through the IDE um, uh, working group. We have an anaesthetic gas working group, uh, which um, has shown to be quite productive with a, um, a study done in, in, a, in a group in Cork where they showed that they can deliver meaningful but um, effective reduction in the, the output from anaesthetic gases in the ICU department there. 
our sustainable healthcare group, Anna will talk on a little bit later. But also sustainable diet in healthcare facilities is a new group that's having a lot of um, momentum at the moment to try to incorporate um, a more sustainable plant-based diet into our hospitals. Our direct action group is um, more of a, it's quite a fun group and it's where we get to go out in the streets and join our other members for, for with Extinction Rebellion and Stop Climate Chaos and attend different protests, for instance, last year with the, the school climate strike. Our community green practice group is run by two excellent GP members who are trying to incorporate green prescribing into um, their practice as well as promoting education amongst GPs. Our air quality research group uh, recently formed is looking at a study about air quality and pollution surrounding hospitals, seeing what kind of environments our hospitals living in and our patients as well. This links in very closely with our research group. Um, as well as our planetary health group and our healthcare divestment fo from fossil fuels um, is also kind of on hold at the moment so I might talk about that later and these are our lovely working group chairs and we currently are looking for a position for the head of our divestment group so if anybody here is interested get in touch so with this in mind and all the kind of um, goals that we have from ID and what we want to do how do we even go about trying to mobilize healthcare workers when it comes to climate change, particularly over the last 12 months where we've seen a real adjustment to how IDE operates and how people respond to the words or to even the mention of climate change. And so one of the biggest things that we do is just awareness, talking about climate change, talking about it with our colleagues. And a lot of the, the, the movement we've seen has been from publications. So our members have written pieces for the media and published in newspapers, as well as for our newsletter. Um, and also for our website. Engagement is another foundation of what we do. Um, and these pictures come from an event we held last year in December, our Planetary Health Awareness Week, where we just set up stalls in all the hospitals that we could and just talk to people, talk to our healthcare staff and just interested people about what it means um, about planetary health. Um, education kind of underpins all of this. And this is a picture from a conference we co-hosted in Galway back in 2019, the Dot Med conference, where we facilitated a green conference and gave um, um, insight and ideas on how to make the conference more sustainable. Social activism. So I touched on this earlier with our direct action group, and it's about taking meaningful action with the groups around us in Dublin um, and getting more involved in a local and um, active way. So this picture is from the climate strike back at the schools in 2019. We participated in a beach clean as well as trying to encourage people to um, support local initiatives with cycle lanes throughout Dublin that have particularly um, driven up in the last few months with the COVID-19 crisis. We also host and co-host several different events. We've had guest speakers come and speak to us because we're aware as doctors, we're not always the experts about climate change. And so we invite different environmental um, guest speakers to come talk, journalists and also scientists to, so that we can learn more about what it is we as doctors need to know. We also co-host different conferences and speak at different events, most recently with the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland and the Royal College of Surgeons. To try to drive meaningful and long-lasting change, we partake in policy development. And we've participated in writing a climate change adaptation plan for the Department of Health here in Ireland last year. This was published in, in December 2019. We hope to have a follow-up involvement with them over the next few years as these action plans um, outlined are rolled out. And most importantly, um, strength comes with numbers. So we recognise the experience and the wealth of um, knowledge that other groups in Ireland and internationally have. And so we work closely with a lot of different or other organisations, um, both nationally and internationally. And in Ireland, we're part of a, an important group called the Climate and Health Alliance, which is the body of different NGOs and health related organisations to try to drive policy change here in Ireland. And like with any other opportunity, it's great to be able to speak here today and to be able to link in with different groups here that might be present and learn more about what each organization can bring to the table. And just as a side note, and as I link into what Anna might say next, when it comes to COVID-19 and sustainable healthcare, they're kind of at a mismatch. So we thought about what about sustainable PPE? And I want to introduce you to this man, Mr. Gareth Higgins. He's a consultant surgical ophthalmologist in Waterford in Ireland. And during COVID initially back in March, all his surgeries were canceled. This was frustrating. And he saw that the amount of waste generated by very straightforward cases in his case, that two large bags uh, were being produced for every procedure and everything was disposable. 
So during COVID, he used this time to approach a sail making company to see if they could make reusable gowns. It's made from nylon tape material and it just requires washing in a high temperature load after each use. So it's what just takes one man to inspire action and drive change. And I really hope he gets to pursue this further. So at this point, I might hand you over to my colleague, Anna. Okay, it would be helpful if I unmuted myself. So can you all hear me well? Yes, we can. Thanks, Anna. Great. Okay, so <laughs> Good good afternoon, and I want to tell you about Green Network, which is an initiative of the IDE Sustainable Healthcare Working Group. So I came to the environmental activism a bit late in life uh, by joining IDE uh, after a dinner party conversation last summer, and if you, if you remember those, um, and she said, oh, you would be a great fit. Uh, so I did join them. I attended shyly somewhat the Extinction Rebellion uh, protest. And my first real action was the Planetary Health Week, uh, where in Tala Hospital, we basically got together, got permission to put two tables in front of the canteen at lunchtime for two lunchtimes. We brought our banner from the Extinction Rebellion, we printed some leaflets, we baked some cookies to attract the masses, and it was the brainwave of Orla here on the right, who is our physiotherapy member, that said, well, why don't we just collect emails and contact numbers of the people who come to talk to us and we'll figure out what to do with them later. So that's the green sheet that you see on the table there. And that's how the green group in Tala University Hospital, where I work, was born. What we found out during those two days is that there were already two groups working in the hospital trying to reduce waste. The anesthetic group, which was looking at reducing plastic packaging in the theater, and the nurses group, which was looking at uh, supplanting the styrofoam medicine cups for uh, uh, carbon, uh, sorry, for uh, cardboard uh, uh, cups. And, and we got to know about these initiatives. So that kind of spurred on uh, looking for other green groups uh, within Irish hospitals. And the ones you see in green are the ones that we currently know about. I'm sure that there are many more that, that we are only about to find. And as we said, green groups in particular, as the IDE are not made just of doctors. There are nurses and pharmacists and physios and porters and cleaners in some instances, which are very helpful. And they all work together in their local hospitals to bring about green change. So what have we done then to, to go to the management, we contacted the National Health Sustainability Office, which is an office from the health executive in uh, health um, service executive in Ireland, and they created Energy Estates Bureau in 2018. This bureau's main purpose is to reduce energy usage through energy management, energy teams in different locations, and behavioral change. And they found the behavioral change to be the most challenging, which is why they were really delighted when they we approached them to engage in certain actions together. They're only working on also working on waste reduction and water conservation. So our groups in mainly in Dublin, but two in Cork, one in Galway and one in Sligo are currently engaging with their energy officers to see how could we forward the, the green healthcare agenda. And what have the green groups in Ireland done so far uh, of their own bat? Well, as you would expect, the waste management was what we were focusing on first. And uh, the groups have done um, both the, the drive for recycling stations, uh, guiding maps as this lady in uh, Cork University Maternity Hospital. And also in Cork University Maternity Hospital, they are looking at bringing these uh, cup holders into the hospital cafe to bring all our reusable cups back into use because I don't know how it is in the rest of Europe but in all of uh, Irish hospitals the cafes have promptly reverted to uh, single-use uh, plastic and paper cups. 
packaging, of course, is a major issue. And this was the, the major drive between, behind the plastic anesthetic group in our hospital, which is also expanding nationally now. Those of us in leadership positions are beginning to, to engage. For example, in my uh, lab, I am a chemical pathologist and work in a biochemistry lab. We are engaging uh, and put it on our annual management review goal to review the packaging for next year and request sustainable packaging from all of our suppliers. In Irish Doctors for the Environment, our goal is to bring these uh, conversations to the National Procurement Office and act that way. Obviously, many energy groups have dealt with uh, reducing energy, for example, informing our local energy officers which areas of the otherwise working departments uh, on the weekends are not used or which ones are used on several days of the week uh, to reduce the, the energy consumption and heat. Oh, many groups have dealt with active transport, improving bike sheds, uh, bike parking, uh, changing areas and engaging with the management on that, as well as improving cycle lanes to access the hospital, which is where the core group was particularly active. More than anything, the green groups have locally created a network of like-minded people in all areas of hospital life. And this has in some instances resulted in a creation of an actual management post and a sustainability officer within a hospital where there was none earlier, which really serves as an important signposting for all the currently non-activist uh, healthcare professionals to get involved. We have spoken at grand rounds and given talks. We have spoken at lunchtime meetings and uh, provided education on climate change and environmentalism. And we have created numerous WhatsApp groups, internet pages, uh, folders with information. Uh, in my hospital, we're planning to put beehives on the, on the hospital flat roof. And we have also uh, fought with the current expansion builders to uh, protect the shrubbery where a particular bird was nesting. We have planted trees in Connolly Hospital and we are planning a national um, tree planting uh, in the hospitals of Ireland next March. So, Yes, we are individually one drop and together we are an ocean. And I do hope that all of the speakers here and all of those who are listening will join in uh, to be a wave of change. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Anna. And thank you, uh, Rachel, for a really fascinating presentation. Really interesting to hear the work you're doing, I suppose, at the national level and at a hospital level as well in Ireland and how you're trying to connect um, all of the dots as well. And I, I think that will provide uh, some inspiration for uh, people joining us today. And uh, again, I hope that as Healthcare Without Harm, we can um, help connect the dots even further to our network that we'll talk about a little bit later too. So before I hand you over to um, uh, Rita from uh, Ext uh, Doctors for Extinction Rebellion, I'd just like to remind uh, attendees that if you do have questions for our panelists, we'll take all of the questions at the end of the presentations and you can put those um, in via the Whova app. So I'd invite you to go to the Q&A um, tab on Whova, type your question in there. Hopefully we'll get to them at the end of the session today. And if not, um, I will invite all of our speakers today as well to, to join Whova over the, uh, the afternoon and the coming days and respond to them uh, individually there as well. So thank you very much again, Anna and Rachel. And now I'd like to uh, invite Rita to join us and, and share her screen. And uh, Rita's from the uh, Doctors for Extinction Rebellion Group in the UK. So uh, the floor is yours, Rita. Great, thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Okay, perfect, thank you. And thanks so much for having me. I really um, loved your presentation, Rachel and Anna. It's so inspiring to hear about everything else that's going on and just to know that there are um, other people doing this work that evidently all of us know is really important, otherwise why would we be here? Um, so I'm here today to speak on behalf of Doctors for Extinction Rebellion. Um, and if I take you back to October 2018, a couple of my friends mentioned that they were going to go down to um, a protest on some bridges in central London. And they said, oh yeah, it's with this new group, Extinction Rebellion. And I've been a climate activist for a while. <laughs> and I was like, what is this group? Like, where has it come from? No one had really heard of it. And it just emerged out of nowhere. 
And I turned up on the bridge. The image at the bottom is actually from that day. Turned up on the bridge and it was incredible. There was so much energy, so much vibrancy. The branding was great. <laughs> there was music. It was joyous. It felt like we were at a carnival. And it felt like something was changing. Um, for a while, I'd felt a little like activism was feeling a bit stale, that people didn't really care about the environment in the way that that was in, that it was important that we should. Um, and yeah, it was just super exciting to have something like Extinction Rebellion suddenly pop up. So for those of you that don't know too much about Extinction Rebellion, Extinction Rebellion has three main demands. The first is for governments to tell the truth um, and uh, to declare a climate emergency. The second is for governments to act now, which is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2025. And that's something that we can talk about. And the third is uh, to move beyond politics. So really to allow in a representative democracy uh, through a system of citizens assemblies. And uh, the, the sort of main first uh, big Extinction Rebellion uh, set of protests was in April of 2019. And, um, the protests were really powerful. We managed to shut down much of central London and that was, um, you know, musicians getting involved and famous people coming out. And there, there was a big conversation happening around, around the climate. And one of the things that we noticed was um, that the media was very quick to say, oh yeah, but these are all crusty hippies who don't have jobs. <laughs> and a few of us who are healthcare professionals came together and said, well, we really care about this. We know that this is really important for healthcare, but uh, the movement is being um, shot down by just saying that you know that that um, you know these people who are just uh, dreamers and it's it's not really relevant um, or manageable. And so we decided through that to set up Doctors for Extinction Rebellion. And what's been really amazing, actually, is since the formation of Doctors for Extinction Rebellion, we've had the formation of lots of other sort of professional interest groups. So we've got lawyers and teachers, engineers, scientists, families, grandparents, you know, everybody coming out in, in their own interest groups and organizing together. Quite early on in Doctors for Extinction Rebellion, we uh, realized that there was a bit of a, of a split in how we wanted to move forwards with the group. Some were very much aligned with um, the demands of Extinction Rebellion, um, were willing to take nonviolent direct action and really wanted to um, sort of pin our badge to Extinction Rebellion. And others for various reasons, uh, some being that they might work within institutions where they can't be seen to be aligning with a group that's breaking the law. Um, others because uh, some of the demands of Extinction Rebellion might be quite difficult to achieve. So for example, the 2025 um, net zero. Um, so as a result of that, pretty early on, we split into two groups, uh, Doctors for Extinction Rebellion and Health Declares a Climate Emergency. And actually, as part of the Extinction Rebellion movement, there have been other um, declares groups that have formed. So there's Culture Declares, Music Declares. And those are groups that generally work within institutions to try and bring about change. And so what we've ended up having with, with our two groups is this quite nice um, sort of insider, outsider uh, organizations that work um, that facilitate each other's work and really we're moving each other forward. So I'm really aware that, you know, we as Doctors for Extinction Rebellion might be calling for 2025. And that means that health declares a climate emergency can go in at the higher levels of, you know, the Royal College of GPs or whatever and say, hey, let's call for 2030. And suddenly that doesn't seem unreasonable uh, because we've shifted the, the goalposts over in a certain direction. And so our groups are, um, are working together and health declares emergency is, um, doing actually a lot of, there, there are some parallels with some of the work that Irish Doctors for the Environment is doing. So working within um, uh, uh, yeah, Royal Colleges, within hospitals, um, bringing in local sustainability measures and things like that. So I ended up writing this article pretty early on within, um, uh, pre pretty early on after setting, co-founding co Doctors for Extinction Rebellion. And uh, within it, I speak about why joining Extinction Rebellion for me as a doctor felt like a moral duty. And partly I was referring back to um, the UK General Medical Council's Goods Clinical Practice, which is as doctors, we need to hold human life with utmost respect. We need to practice from an evidence base and we need to act promptly when patient safety may be compromised. And I think one of the questions is um, for me, 
where does that duty end? Is it when we uh, step out of our consulting room? Is it uh, on the boundaries of our hospital? What if something happens to somebody just outside our hospital? What if we're in an area where there's very high air pollution and that's impacting our children's lungs? Um, where you know wh where are the reaches of that duty? And and for me and for many of us involved in this movement, and I'm sure also for many of you, that is to also take action on the climate crisis because we know that it's going to cause a lot of ill health and a lot of suffering. It already is. So um, this is uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Cliff Kendall. And I think it was maybe our second meeting of Doctors for Extinction Rebellion. Uh, we were talking about the sort of different actions that we could do. And Cliff, uh, you know, and, and we said, oh, maybe something that we could try as a hunger strike at some point. You know, there's a, there's a long history of hunger strikes within activism. And we thought, oh, maybe this is something we could use. And it was coming up to the summer rebellion of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, this is back in 2019. And um, Cliff called up uh, one day and he was like, I, um, I've not eaten for five days. I was like, oh, okay. He's like, yeah, I'm on hunger strike. And I was like, great, does anyone know? And he was like, no, I've not told anyone. It's like, okay, <laughs> we need to get the word out there. And um, Cliff ended up going down and sitting outside the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, and on around day 11 and 12, he started to get some interest and he ended up being on hunger strike for two weeks. Uh, one of our other members, Professor Peter Cole, um, Professor of Respiratory Medicine, also went on hunger strike during uh, the October Rebellion, and he was on hunger strike for 23 days. Our first main action, which was actually really great just to bring together um, lots of different professionals from around the country, was again outside the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And it was a good action because there were some people who went into it saying, yes, I want to get arrested. Uh, there was four people who were arrested for gluing themselves to the building. Um, but for many others, it was also an opportunity to get to get, you know, um, to, to hold the banner, to do this die-in, to create a visual effect that meant that, um, that people would hear about the action. And I'm just going to show you a short video from that day. Um, the video might be a tiny bit glitchy with the internet, but hopefully the sound should be okay. I took an oath that the duty to my patients would come first. With the climate crisis, protection and safety of my patients is not coming first. And therefore it's up to us as doctors to lay down a marker and say enough is enough. When you've read the science, you get nightmares. Floods, wildfires, rising sea levels, extinction of all those animals that we rely on. In the global south, people are already living with the effects of extreme weather and climate change. I've seen it. I'm an a &E doctor. I've looked after people in some of those settings. I'm a practicing GP. I've not been involved in activism before. I've done all the usual writing letters, signing petitions and so on. But things still go on getting worse and worse. Having been a pretty lifelong conformist who doesn't really like upsetting people, this is well out of my comfort zone, but it's just something that's got to be done. It does seem to be something that will make a difference and that there is a chance of turning this thing around. I'm a mother of three. I've come here today to do something about the climate crisis with other doctors and make our voices heard. I've got three kids and they're really the reason why I'm here because they want to think about their future and feel genuinely scared. They'll have a duty to them really to, to act so that when they turn around to me in 10 years and say, well, Dad, what did you do when you found out about this stuff? But I, I can too much. I try to just keep going to work and just plodding on. I'm feeling really nervous but it feels much better to be doing something about it than feeling totally powerless to make any difference at all. My baby will be 31 in 2050 and I have no idea what her future holds. When your government refuses to look after you and your children, you have to act. I've done everything that's polite, so now it's come to this. I feel I have no choice but to prevent. I'm doing this because the government isn't taking action on climate change. This is our duty. This is our duty. Our duty to do whatever we can. Oh no. <laughs> I took an oath Sorry. that the duty to my patients of... would come first Technical with the climate crisis protection. <laughs> okay, great. Let's just get this one up. Okay. So that was in uh, September and then in October we took part in the October Rebellion and for that we um, set up something called the Planetary Health Hub. It was um, 
at a protest site as part of Extinction Rebellion, but we were part of a site that um, had lots of people in it that didn't necessarily want to be uh, breaking the law just by being there or to get arrested. Um, so it was us, we were with um, Extinction Rebellion Youth, um, the, the disabled members group, um, and the Global Solidarity Network. And as part of um, the two weeks of rebellion, we organized to host the Planetary Health Hub. Uh, and this was two weeks of talks for other healthcare professionals and members of the public on the climate crisis. Unfortunately, we only managed to last for five days before the protest site was taken down. Um, we then also that weekend um, organized a large uh, march, which actually ends up, it, I mean, I think this actually speaks to how important our voice is as healthcare professionals. I mean, we know that we are um, the most trusted members in society and we can, as a group of two or 300 healthcare professionals, go and support 30,000 other people who are on the streets and we're the ones that make the headlines. And I think that that's really important to consider where and how our voice can be used in service of a wider movement. Um, we got met, uh, coverage in all of the major um, UK newspapers. Um, yeah, and, and very far reaching impression. At the same time, The Lancet also came out in uh, support of what we were doing and Richard Horton, uh, the editor of The Lancet said, it might be an exaggeration to say that healthcare workers have 14 days to change the world, but not much. Um, and their main editorial that week was about Extinction Rebellion. And Richard Horton has subsequently come out in support of Extinction Rebellion. I'll show you this video as well. This is an edited version and you could see the long version um, on, uh, on our website. My name is Richard Horton and I'm editor of The Lancet. The climate crisis is one of the most, I would say the most, existential crisis facing our communities in the world today. Doctors and all health professionals have a responsibility and obligation to engage in all kinds of non-violent social protest to address the climate emergency. If every single person who's a health professional just did one thing every single week, we'd be having millions of people committing themselves, acting in a way that when you multiply that up over time could be absolutely transformational. The brave acts, sometimes the small brave acts of a large number of people have made the difference. My name is Richard Horton. <laughs> I knew that that was going to happen again. Right, there we go. Um, yeah, and actually just going back to what Richard Horton said and getting the support of the Lancet and also the British Medical Journal, that was incredibly important for us. I think for a lot of doctors who are getting involved, um, some were going into it knowing that there was going to be a risk of arrest. Uh, for all of us who've not wanted to be arrested, we have not been arrested. For those who have wanted to be arrested, they have been arrested. So that, you know, there has been some element of choice in it. Um, but I think it's understandable for us as healthcare professionals to be concerned about what that might mean in terms of our registration and in terms of our careers. And to have somebody like Richard Horton coming out and saying, it is the duty of uh, healthcare professionals to engage in nonviolent direct protest, that's incredibly um, important and, you know, and valuable and supportive. And actually at the moment we have some of um, the court cases going through of doctors who were arrested that October. Um, and soon we'll see what the General Medical Council says in response to that. And hopefully that will set some sort of precedent for um, how clinicians can engage in nonviolent direct action. Uh, this action was a couple of months ago, and this was a climate coroner's court. And it was very visually striking. And actually, one of the, th the things that we do recognize as doctors for extinction rebellion is how important it is to make it um, visually striking and make it moving in some sense, the actions that we're trying to do. And our most recent action was um, uh, health warnings on petrol pumps. So the type of warnings that you might get on cigarette packets, putting that uh, 20,000 stickers were placed on petrol pumps around the country uh, in a coordinated day of action. Um, and it also got coverage in various newspapers as well. So we've had multiple successes and I would say that these aren't all our own personal successes. We are just one part of a broader ecosystem of climate and health uh, work that is going on but we've had uh, various hospitals, um, royal colleges, um, 
and organizations declare a climate emergency and also commit to divest from fossil fuels. And that's been um, where our pressure has been sort of internally within our institutions. We're also finding ourselves with an increasingly global network. So in the UK, we have about a thousand members and we have other groups and other similar groups um, popping up all around the world. Something that's felt really important to me is also training of spokespeople to speak to the media. I think that we do, um, as clinicians, hold this very unique position where we can both uh, take quite complicated science and explain it in a way that's um, uh, that lands with people. That's you know that is our that is our job partly as healthcare professionals. And so, how do we extend that into the climate space, and how can we um, use that voice to speak? more publicly. And I think something that's been incredibly important is that there's been lots of people within our network who felt like they've been doing this alone for a long time. And just to find others who are also working towards it is incredibly important. So uh, what next? Um, Doctors for Extinction Rebellion is, um, uh, continues to be active. What I really like about it, actually, so I've found during coronavirus, I've had lots of other work on and I've had to take a bit of a step back and others have been able to step forward. And someone explained it to me the other day as um, it's like we're all singing in a choir and uh, you just know that the choir is going to keep on singing, even if you need to take a breath. And I think that that's really important to remember just in activism more generally that um, it comes and goes in cycles and it's important for us to rest and also then step back into it when we have the energy to do so. Something which I'm uh, curious about is how we move forward towards COP and how we can mobilize a street presence of healthcare professionals uh, for that um, and to really put pressure on, um, uh, on the conference to make sort of big moves um, towards taking action on, on the climate. And I'm, and I'm open to speaking about that in the Q&A afterwards. So thanks very much. You can find us um, on Twitter and you can uh, have a look at our website as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Rita. And again, really amazing examples uh, from the UK. Again, a slightly different approach, uh, I suppose, uh, to, to how Irish doctors for the environment operate. But again, the underlying principles are still the same and that, you know, um, doctors are feeling that there's this moral obligation to take action on, on uh, environmental issues. And uh, again, I think uh, really powerful and inspiring examples of, of some of the amazing work uh, happening in the UK. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, so we've had quite a few questions come in. Again, a reminder to participants, if you would like to ask a question to any of our panelists or all of our panelists, or to us at Healthcare Without Harm, please do put them in the Q&A um, tab on Whova, and we will get to them um, at the end of the presentations and we'll follow up with those we don't get to um, either later for today or uh, next week. And again, our panelists uh, will, will be um, active on, on Whova as well to do that. Um, so our last speakers today are Reinhard, uh, Felix and uh, Marlena from Germany who are going to talk to us a bit about the um, German Climate Change and Health Alliance and some of the work they're doing there to engage with health professionals uh, in, in the environmental movement there. So I'm going to hand you over to uh, Reinhard first and I will share your presentation, Reinhard, and hopefully this works. So Reinhard, the floor is yours and let me share this for you. Can you see this okay? Thank you very much. Yes, I can see it. Great, but we I can would hear like you. I would like to invite Marlene to give some introduction, please. Yes. I hope you can hear me all. Hello, everybody. I'm Marlene from Germany. I'm a medical student and a researcher in Germany and also part of KLUG, which is, is the Alliance for Climate Change and Health. This is what KLUG says in German. It's Klimawandel und Gesundheit. So in case you wonder, actually we would have been four people. Florian has just fallen ill, so we are three of us. And I'll just introduce us and then Reinhard and Felix will speak and in the end I'll sum up. Um, and this or the, the fact that we would have been four people would have shown you a little bit how we worked, how we developed multi-level strategies to um, to react to the challenge of climate change and health, but from a healthcare point of view um, on different levels. So, um, ah yeah, another point which is really important is also in Germany, many different organizations working on this topic of climate change and health. And Klug is one big of these, which we will present to you now. 
uh, hand over to Reinhardt. Thank you very much, Marlene, for the introduction. Thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation um, to have this opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about Klug. Um, I must say I was very impressed by the presentations by our colleagues from Ireland and from Great Britain. It was a big inspiration. It gave us a lot of new ideas, I think. And it just shows again how the Anglo-Saxophone uh, uh, countries have been far ahead of uh, Central Europe in terms of uh, identifying the problem and in terms of addressing it. Um, if it comes to research or to uh, uh, advocacy and um, activities, uh, you, you, you're you just so far ahead of us. It's, um, so we take it as a positive point uh, and it's very encouraging for us to go forward. So um, what happened? Um, three years ago, a couple of friends of us, uh, we met in Berlin and what we did is uh, we made, we started making a diagnosis and uh, of course this continues. The diagnosis said, um, the planet is sick. The earth is, has fever and uh, there's an emergency. Just, just as you all said already. And um, as uh, medical professionals, we had to look at it more in detail and take our conclusions from it. And so what we did is uh, we founded an organization, a group, next slide please, um, called Klug three years ago, uh, the uh, German um, alliance regarding climate change and health. And uh, Klug, what is it today? It is a network. It is a network of individual members from the health sector, health professionals of all categories and um, of organizations in the German health sector, including um, insurances, for instance, or medical schools, or hospitals. Uh, so Klug is an institution, a registered association, uh, has a head office in Berlin and um, many groups in Germany all over. In addition to Klug uh, as an organization, we founded a platform for transformative action at the grassroots level, and we called it Health for Future. And um, Health for Future is the movement um, decentralized all over Germany in many groups. And uh, so I would say with our construction of having Klug as an institution and Health for Future as a grassroots level activity uh, um, um, organization, uh, we kind of combine the two approaches from Ireland and from the Extinction Rebellion. Next, please. So parting, uh, building on our uh, diagnosis, uh, we of course defined uh, a number of goals that we want to reach. Um, the first uh, imp most important thing is uh, that we start sensitizing the health sector in Germany, the actors, um, about the situation, about the diagnosis, and so that they can see what the critical challenges in the health sector are stemming from the climate change crisis. There wasn't much at all of, uh, of awareness in Germany so far, and certainly not in the health sector. So, um, after that, uh, we set our goals to um, do something about the health sector itself. And uh, so if we go to the hospital sector, sector um, we are aiming at fostering the development towards a zero emission strategy in the hospital sector. And uh, we have started with that already. 
And the same is true, of course, um, for um, private practitioners. Then, as a next point, um, we find it imp very important to highlight the enormous co-benefits for health of climate mitigation. So that's a very important part of our strategy. We don't want to only um, show the uh, emergency part of it and the, the dangers. We want to point to a positive future. So here it comes to the issue of, um, of communication, of climate communication. We take it very seriously. It's a very complex and uh, difficult issue, uh, but that's that comes in here um, if we want to be successful. And finally, we want to call on the health sector in Germany to take its responsibility and leadership in the society. We all know that the health sector has the advantage of being uh, highly respected in the population and also in politics in parts so we are listened to, at least sometimes, and we have a good chance of being listened to, and people trust us. So uh, we want to use that uh, situation, and we also find it as um, a moral duty, as uh, I just heard it, um, and as part of our pledge to avert dangers from our patients. Next slide, please. So here come, uh, and comes a number of fields of action. And uh, the first of all, uh, the first of them is uh, agenda setting. So advocacy uh, at different societal levels and institutional levels. And we talk to politicians, we talk to hospital uh, directors, and we talk to representatives of, uh, of the, the economy, economical environment and uh, so uh, this is to show that uh, this is one of the levels where we where we um, try to to point at the situation and to create an awareness and to stimulate change, political change mainly. Then, of course, we we find that um, being um, medical professionals, a huge number of possible change agents are the private practitioners. In Germany, we have about 100,000 of them. And we find that we must try to, um, to, to utilize the opportunity of sensitizing them to create a little bit of change in the lifestyles of their patients, for instance, and in other issues. I will come back to this part of this uh, field of action a little bit later more in more detail. Then, as I already pointed out, we work with hospitals and other institutions um, for zero emissions. So they should really lower their own footprint. And um, we have heard about uh, a number of very good examples given from the UK. Then also we find uh, that um, the issue has to enter into the curricula in the educational system at university level and at the level of medical schools, for instance. And we cooperate with them and we've already had some successes in some of the universities. Next, please. As the issue of climate change has to be seen in a larger context, which has recently uh, being called uh, the planetary health context. And we find this context, this description very, very useful because it comprises the different uh, aspects of our lifestyle results and how we uh, go beyond the planetary boundaries. So what we have done, we have started an Internet, an online planetary health academy 
with a, a number of with a number of sessions in in spring and uh, we just started last week again with the second part of it and if you are interested you are most welcome to participate and uh, to register for it in the first round in spring we had about 4000 people uh, registered and we have very high level speakers there so please um, take a look A very important part of our activities is to go to the grassroots level. So to go where the action is, where the change must happen and where acceptance of change must be created. And for that, we created the system of health for future groups. And uh, I'm not going into more details because Felix is talking about that a little bit later. As you all are doing as well, we are partnering with other organizations which have the same goals in Germany and of course abroad. That's why we're here today. And another target group, we have identified another level between grassroots and government is the communities. So um, we have opened a department and uh, uh, an activity field um, to cooperate with communities and with organizations of communities to sensitize them and show them or elaborate with them, together with them, uh, ways of respecting planetary boundaries. It starts off with uh, activity plans for heat waves. Next, please. So I come to one of our particular fields of activity, and that is the approach in private practices. Uh, since we see a very big opportunity here. As I said, we have so many GPs in Germany and we now, I'm, I'm one of them myself or have been at least, um, there is a lot of sensitivity for that. And the issues, they, they come up in consultation every day with many patients who are overweight, who have, who have heart disease, who have allergies, you all know it. And um, this is a huge opportunity to go beyond the immediate and individual treatment and diagnosis and show the larger context of it. So how we all contribute to the change of planetary system situations and how we all could change them and benefit ourselves for our health if we do so. So we have approached those um, GPs and a large number of special, specialist practices. And that's uh, a an, an most interesting issue of that. Uh, Marlene is going to tell you a little bit about that at the end. Next, please. So the three pillars of what happens in, uh, in the private practices or what should happen. One is the, the individual talk to the patients about what lifestyle change means for health as well as for the health of the planet. And this can be done in talks, of course, through posters, through flyers. And um, most important, of course, is that the whole team of the office is sensitized and part of that and aware. So if they are aware, they are encouraged to change their own footprint as well in the, in the office. And we've heard something about that already, like um, ordering um, uh, medical equipment, consumables, or what kind of uh, the energy management and so on, and, tra and transport, yeah. But beyond that, we think that private practitioners usually have a high role to play in the society environment. So in that context, they are usually parts of many groups and that's another opportunity for them to, 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 to out themselves as advocates of change agents towards climate mitigation. Next, please. Kluk is also starting to um, make this issue uh, 
more uh, to approach it on an international level. So that's why we are cooperating in research as well as in activities with other organizations internationally. We are part of uh, Planetary Health uh, Alliance, of course. And we have just opened a Planetary Health Hub in Eastern Africa, in Nairobi. So we want to facilitate the distribution and the dissemination of knowledge and of skills and of ideas throughout the world. At this point, um, next please. I want to hand over to Felix, who is going to tell you a lot about our fantastic Health for Future program. Thank you, Reinhard. Yeah, so as Reinhard said, next to Klug, which is technically a registered NGO, there's also the Health for Future movement, which is uh, which represents more like a decentralized grassroots movement, similar to other for future movements, such as Fridays for Future. And yeah, this this approach has proven to be to to work quite well because yeah, we can use um, yeah, different strategies, different approaches. We can use sort of the inner workings of a registered NGO and the benefits that provides, but then also we have the, 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 the dynamic and the flexibility uh, of a movement. And many of many of the members of Klug, they're also activists at Health for Future and the other way around. And um, yeah, one, one other thing that relates to is also what Rita mentioned, the, the insider and outsider strategies. And, and many of us, uh, we have become quite... Uh, well, I guess quite quite skilled and in in using these labels also playful when when we act as members of Klug and when we act as activists at at Health for Future, and sometimes it can be a bit confusing, <laughs> even for ourselves. But um, all in all, it's it's proven to be mutual beneficial, I believe. And yeah, similar to um, to IDE, we also uh, comprise people from all uh, health professions and. Um, yeah, that, that is actually really quite wide. So I myself personally, I, my background is in management of social innovations and environmental policy in terms of what I studied, but I, I used to work in sustainable finance with a focus on, on analyzing pharmaceutical companies. And, and I co-founded a, a business that provided vocational training uh, for, for people who, who worked in care abroad a network. And uh, Health for Future, the focus is really always on, on trying to identify opportunities for transformative action in various fields. So, so we started out uh, a, a bit more than a year ago, basically with, with activism, local activism, we were taking to the streets. Um, and then obviously, yeah, uh, COVID uh, came and, and affected uh, us all. And, but our, our goal was always really not, not to you know, focus on one single strategy, but to always see, okay, where there are potential windows of opportunity in other realms as well. So we've been doing a lot of political agenda setting uh, with other means and um, also been focusing on education. And I will, I will show a few examples of that. And overall, this, this, I believe it has worked quite well. So, so we've grown quite significantly and we have now close to 60 groups uh, all over Germany and uh, several thousand people that, that we reach and mobilize. And the groups, they, they work independently from each other and they, they plan their own actions, they, they take their own decisions, but they're also quite well connected um, and share resources, uh, synergies, and uh, when it makes sense, also uh, plan and run projects and campaigns together. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, this is one example of uh, activism that actually took place uh, on the streets still. So this uh, summer we, we've met up in, or yeah, well, late summer, um, early autumn in September to cycle for two days from, from Koblenz uh, to Cologne uh, and brought together about 100 uh, activists um, from all over Germany to spread the word about health for future, but it was also, and I think that this also uh, relates to, to the points that were made before. So there was also very important for our community. So while, yeah, we've met up uh, mostly via Zoom and other uh, means before, it was, was super important and super helpful, I believe, to also to meet in, in person uh, once at least this year. 
Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so next to, to actions that we do um, all together, um, there are also uh, countless participations in climate strikes in different cities, but also health for future groups that organize their own um, their own climate strikes and climate demonstrations. For instance, the, the biggest one this year, it was it took place in Aachen that was mainly organized by Health for Future. And we had more than 700 people uh, showing up. And this is, yeah, so actually one of, of our pillars. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of political agenda setting, um, one more thing that we're focusing on is really trying to, to engage with uh, politicians and members of parliament uh, and, and public representatives directly. So one of the things we uh, did recently, a few weeks ago, we, was to start the Health of Future Skills Lab, where we try to provide uh, our activists um, with the skills they need uh, to, to be active at Health of Future. The first skills lab that, that we ran was a, a three-part uh, workshop series, series where we, where we um, partnered with, with experts and, and practitioners um, and uh, basically learned about, okay, how do you actually get an appointment with the public representatives? What are good strategies to use? How do you build a relationship in a, in a conversation that you have? And we had uh, about 100 people participate in the skills lab who then subsequently approach their, uh, their representatives. And this was sort of also a trial run for us um, with the, the elections upcoming and the general elections upcoming in Germany next year. And yeah, we are in the planning phase for, for a larger campaign to, to mobilize all uh, of our network in different ways. So activism is one part of it, but then also approaching politicians directly would be another. Uh, next slide, please. So um, also in the political realm is a divestment campaign that we currently run that targets the physicians pension funds that have about 100 billion uh, euros invested and we want to uh, get them to divest from fossil fuels and to divest more sustainably. And here also you see these two levels of, of knowledge and strategy and research sharing on the national level, but then the action takes place also on a local and regional level where activists use their networks to lobby the pension funds. And we have had first successes in Berlin, uh, Bremen, Saxony, and Thuringia. Uh, next slide, please. So the last example uh, that I want to present is basically to come back just briefly to the Planetary Health Academy that I had mentioned. So it's an open uh, online course. And it also, I think it illustrates quite well uh, how Klug and Health for Future work together. So it's mainly organized by Klug, but uh, it, there's a strong focus on transformative action and Health for Future activists Within the lectures, they provide examples of their work and uh, what they do, but it's also um, an example of transformative action in itself, I think. So similar to, uh, to what, what we've heard before, we also want to get um, the planetary health to be integrated in the, in the curriculum at the universities and uh, Health for Future groups basically spoke to their universities locally to, to advocate for the Planetary Health Academy to be um, recognized as a, an elective course and that worked in several instances and then also in other instances um, students they start their own or they, 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 they get the universities to start their own elective courses. Uh, yeah, just one last word. So this time it's in English, as, as Reinhard uh, said, and we have uh, participants from more than 73 countries, which we are super excited about. And uh, yeah, feel free to also uh, yeah, join us at the Planetary Earth Academy. Now, yeah, on to Marlene with the next slide. Okay, now I'm talking to you as a member of Health for Future, the local group of Tübingen, and also as a researcher. As a researcher, on the one hand, I'm, actually, I'm momentarily doing my doctoral thesis on single use versus uh, reuse uh, instruments in urology. And I've just uh, come from the clinic to, from measuring the, the ways of, of different um, material used in the sterilization process of these uh, instruments. However, on the other hand, um, I'm a researcher in this um, in this project you see on the slide, um, which is a nationwide survey for um, doctors um, asking questions about climate change and medical practices. 
this year, my research research partner, Nicolas Mesker, who has just um, joined us for some seconds, um, and I, we have um, developed a survey for doctors working in medical practices of any kind. And we want to collect first data in this field and ask how doctors think about climate change in their medical practices. And um, if they even worry about climate change, um, they are talking about it with their patients and are there any obstacles um, which keep them from doing so? And what they, what they expect future will bring in this field. Um, I just saw that we have now, I think it's, a, it's nearly thousand, sorry, nearly thousand people have participated. It's only 40 left for thousand participants. And then we have quite a lot of answers, but still um, we are glad if many more people join and do the survey and we aim to present the results in the beginning of 2021 and um, with these contribute to a transformational discussion in this field and also probably changes in policies. Um, the Kluge Alliance on Health for Future as well were huge uh, and are a huge support in this um, project and this study, especially in networking. Last slide please. And as you all know, yeah. Um, networking is, um, is a big topic in this field. Um, we will probably leave this um, slide for the discussion so that you can copy all the links. Um, so now I hope that, um, that you, can, you kind of um, understood how we use different strat strategies to aim at our shared goal, which is putting climate change um, on the agenda and to reach yeah, transformation. Um, and also in this way that each, um, each and every one of us uh, in, in his or her personal way, but connected all over our planet contributes to clean medicine. Yeah, that is, um, that was our part. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> and please ask questions. I don't know if there are any yet. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Marlene and, and Felix and, and Reinhardt for that. Um, really, really interesting to see how the work is developing in, in, uh, in Germany. And um, what's particularly interesting for me is to see all these parallels and to see how, how these networks are developing and working. And again, with that same shared purpose, but also really interesting to see how the, the Klug and Health for Future work in parallel, um, similar to how Doctors for Extinction Rebellion and the Health Declares movements in the UK um, uh, operate and again uh, probably because of the same reasons so uh, really really fascinating thank you all for that um, we have had some questions in which I am going to try and get to if I can move my screen um, and so there's one a few questions from um, uh, David Brasfield I suppose one for us at Healthcare Without Harm. And David says, there are now several nationally organized groups of health personnel. Are they collaborating optimally? Um, should Healthcare Without Harm assist? And uh, we're inviting, as you'll see in a moment, individual healthcare personnel to be members, but is that enough? And has top management been successfully uh, invited to these actions? So again, I'll speak about the, the work we're doing to this end in, in a few moments, but I suppose maybe a a question for you all as well is, is how can we scale up um, this work? How can we work together as organizations, again, at different levels? Uh, and how can we, I suppose, maximize our, our impact at a, at a European or a global level? Because it's really obvious that you're having impact at a local level. Um, so maybe I'll just put that as a general question and slightly change your, your, your uh, question, David, if that's okay. And uh, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that from our panel. I was actually thinking about that uh, when I was looking to uh, uh, watching the, the other session the other day and, and there was a session on, on European procurement and medical devices regulation and all of that. And I really think I had not thought about calling my MEP until that moment. Uh, Irish Doctors for the Environment did engage with our local TDs, which is the members of parliament talk to Dala if I say it right enough in Osgoelge. And, um, but I, I just think that 
I was thinking for myself, I should be calling the MEP and, and maybe we should all be calling our MEPs and, and making our, our views known. Thank you, Anna. And again, I think that that's a role healthcare and harm can play in working with you all to do that. Um, but yeah, a very good point because again, that there's there's these different levels of action, and it's really important that we're acting at all of those different levels. Um, I don't know if anybody else from the panel would like to respond or have some more questions. Uh, Reinhard. Yeah, I would like to uh, support what Anna just said. Um, I think what. What what we've just seen is that we have the same problems and the same issues. And so if we talk about procurement, for instance, um, procurement is a European issue, not a national or local issue. So uh, if we all push towards um, decarbonization in, in the procurement sector and uh, in the consumable sector, um, we can very well cooperate because we have to know, we first have to know where, what kind of, what instruments do we have? So one of them is pressure and pressure is better if it is bigger. So we should be, we should join our forces and uh, tell the producers, uh, we don't want your products unless they comply with this and this. So this is something we should do together, I think. For just to give an example. Absolutely, Reinhard. And, and we know that procurement and, and uh, scope three emissions make up a huge um, amount of, of emissions from the healthcare sector and is absolutely an opportunity. And I think a role for clinicians to, to play as well as part of their procurement teams uh, within their, their hospitals as well. Um, so I just want to move on to a few more questions. There's a couple for, for Rita specifically. Uh, one from David again, I think this was uh, specifically for Cliff, who I think did the, the hunger strike. I don't think he's doing it anymore. And how could he, uh, we send Cliff a care package? Uh, I think that I believe, I hope Cliff has ended his hunger strike now, but I suppose if I can rephrase that question, how can we support uh, doctors like Cliff uh, who are doing these actions? Oh, um, yeah, so Cliff is back working in South Africa, which is where he's been based for the past few years. Um, and I think for Cliff, actually, so much of what he's doing is because he's seen frontline what happens to communities when they're at the sharp end of of the impacts of what we what we're doing here in in places like London and Germany and Ireland um so I think just supporting Cliff by getting involved really I think that's probably what would make him happiest thank you Rita um I'll take one more question for you and then maybe one for the group before we move on but I will say there are plenty more questions here that we're not going to get to I see nine and on my list and more probably coming in. So again, I'd really encourage all of our panelists today to, to log on to Whova and maybe um, respond directly to some of these questions if you do have some time after the session today or, or over the weekend or, or next week. Um, uh, one for uh, Rita in terms of uh, for Doctors for Extinction Rebellion, uh, what has happened to the doctors who have been arrested and has this impacted their job security? Right. Um, yeah, I think that's really important. And lots of people ask about that before they join us. Um, for me, for example, I've not been arrested and um, and it's been fine. <laughs> like I'm fully involved in the group. And also I've been able to not be arrested. So I've never been in a situation where that's even really been on the cards because we'll go into an action knowing who is arrestable and what other roles there are. Um, for the people who have been arrested, many of them have spoken to their employer beforehand. Um, and seeing that that would be okay. Generally, if it's non-violent and it's non-fraudulent, um, then we're hoping it should be fine. But as I mentioned, I think we're going to find out um, through yeah, through the coming weeks and months, actually, as those cases start to go through the courts. And as they then, um, so it's after the case has been through the court, then it goes to the General Medical Council. And we'll see, um, and we'll see what the outcome is. But we're hoping that actually with the support of, of, like groups like the Lancet, for example, that that's going to um, act in our doctors' favours. Yeah. Great, thank you, Rita. And again, I'm, I'm sure people can follow the stories via your website and via your, your yeah. social media channel as well. Um, thank you. Um, we have two more questions which I'll take, but again, I'm, I do apologize for those who had post questions that we don't get to. Um, but two important ones that have come in, one from uh, uh, Tomas. Um, what can be done 
um, and the most effective way of mobilizing colleagues to become involved and interested more effectively in sustainability issues within the healthcare environment. So, um, uh, Tomás gives an example in the University Dental Clinic in Hungary, where I work, it seems hardly anybody is aware of or interested in these issues to, to uh, deal with. So I suppose a, a question for you all in terms of how have you engaged with your colleagues and, and co-workers to raise awareness about environmental issues within within the sector and, and what are, have you found to be the most engaging ways of doing that. I know, Anna, you gave a really good example of, of the, the table that, that IDE had put up on, on the information day, but maybe others have other examples. Uh, Rachel, yes, please. Yeah, so thank you. It's a very good question. And it's actually quite a hard one to answer because I think we've all experienced in a hospital setting anyway, that there can be a lot of resistance to making changes. Um, and as Anna mentioned as well, behavioural change is actually the biggest impact to that. Um, so what we've tried to do is, is you know, engage people. We found that just speaking to people one on one has a much more impactful event. Um, you know, chatting to your colleagues in the break room or talking about things that you feel kind of passionate about has had much more meaningful um, changes that we've noticed. An example that I've had is when I was in a junior doctor um, working with a team, a gastrointestinal team. Um, on the scopes unit and um, you know I just noticed the styrofoam cups were being used for every patient coming through um, for their tea and to hold dentures um, and I just thought that was such a waste it's totally unnecessary and I just took one action to speak to the head nurse to ask why that was the case there was no answer to explain the need for it and we just changed it and that had a huge considerable reduction in that unnecessary waste just by one question to a head nurse um, and, and that was real small step, but it was really empowering. And I, you know, chatted about it with my colleagues and then suddenly each department that has an intervention was doing the same thing. If it wasn't scopes, it was theater or down in the eye unit where they do similar day case procedures. So I think when people try to make changes in hospitals or institutions, you can meet, meet a lot of resistance, but actually you can just make little changes and then they lead to a collaborative effort to, to bigger changes. Thank you, Rachel. Absolutely. Rita? I'll just really quickly add to that, that we've worked with an organisation called Climate Outreach, which has some really great resources, including um, the Talking Climate Handbook. And that gives you some frameworks for how you can speak to, to people and basically meet them where you're at and tell stories, essentially, is, <laughs> is cool. Thank you. I think Marlena had a, also one more response yeah and just by doing things differently or doing things your own way and people um yeah observe you doing it and it can be like that the the doctors and also the cleaning personnel and everybody and also another point probably would be from my point of view now um doing research in this um in this field um because there hasn't been a lot yet i would say and um, for example, when you, you go to the hospital and ask people about how they use things, um, you get into a conversation. And I think this, this speaking to people is the most, um, the most powerful. For example, today I went to the post station of the clinic because they have a, a weight that can measure the, the weight, the very small weights. Um, and I talked to them about my project um, and this became a conversation as well. And it's, it's the post people. So you can like, yeah, talk to everybody and then get, get things a little bit on the way, probably, hopefully. Thank you, Marlene. Yes, that's really important. And again, I'm sure there's plenty of our attendees as well who have plenty of ideas and, and, uh, and ways in which they've been able to do this. So again, please get on Hoover and, and please post your, your comments, suggestions, answers there as well. I think uh, this is a, a really a platform for us to share ideas and, and to uh, see what we can uh, do together. Um, I do want to move on, but I want to take one more question because I think it's really important and not something we, we have touched on for, for everybody again. And again, I'm conscious of the time and that we have five minutes left in this session. So we will run over. So I do apologize in advance. Uh, if you can stick with us, uh, uh, please do. Um, uh, I'll invite Maria to, to post some information about our Doctors for Greener Healthcare network in the chat box uh, for those of you who can't stay on. Um, but I will, uh, like I said, take one more question, which I think is a really important one from uh, Tim Malone, who asks, um, how should we engage our patients in the planetary health emergency. Um, and again, I think that that's really important and not something we've touched on, I think, so far. I don't know if any of our panel would like to, to jump in on that one. Anna? 
I have used this line. I work in diabetes clinic and in lipid clinic, and I have said, well, basically what's good for you is good for the planet. Move on your own muscle, eat uh, less processed foods, kind of that. I really love that. Eat food, mostly plant, plants, not too much. That, that really summarizes it up for, because all of our advice in, in diabetes and metabolic clinics is this is compatible with the health of the planet. So um, if we can weave it in our daily consultations, that's where it works. Great, thank you, Anna. I don't know if anybody else would like to jump in. You read it, yes? Oh yeah, I'll maybe just say on that, that for me personally, and I, and I really get that there should be, we need some individual change, but generally I feel we need systems change. And actually I, I would ideally like us to get to a point whereby the easy option to take is going to be the one that's best for the planet as well. So it's just going to be cheaper and easier to get a train. It's going to be cheaper and easier to um, eat local, you know, like all of, all of those things. And so I would really, um, I don't want it to be too much on, on my patients to have to make that decision themselves. I would hope that we'd just be able to shift it at a systems level whereby it will just mean that that's what's happening more broadly. Thank you, Rita. Any final comments from our panel before we move on? No. Well, again, uh, I will thank you all for, for your input and thank you all for your questions. There are many more that we didn't get to and some comments also. Um, and again, I'd like to invite our, our, our panelists to uh, hop on Whova, um after this session or again in the coming days and, and pick some of those up because I think there's really interesting discussions uh, starting to happen uh, there as well. Um, and so what I would like to do for our last few minutes is just uh, talk a little bit about our uh, Doctors for Greener Healthcare um, network at Healthcare at Harm, which is a network we're just uh, starting to build and launch uh, actually this week at, um, at uh, CleanMed. And again, what we hope to do here is, is build up some of the um, build on some of some of the, those movements happening at the national level that we've heard about today. And again, like we've heard about today, some of the things we know already, so we know that the delivery of healthcare services can often undermine health. And we've heard about the, the climate footprint of healthcare, for example, we know that it's 4.4% of, of emissions globally, often in European countries, it's, it's even higher than that. If the healthcare sector were a country, if you were to aggregate the, the emissions from the healthcare sector, it'd be the fifth largest emitter on the planet. And we know that in Europe as well, it's a, a particular problem and, and the EU is, is third in terms of healthcare emissions just behind uh, the US and, uh, and China. So um, there's a huge opportunity for us to uh, mitigate the, the, the impact of, um, of healthcare delivery itself. Um, we also know, and we've heard about this today, that you know doctors are in a unique position. They're uh, really trusted members of our society uh, and also within the institutions in which they work. They have a, a really unique opportunity to, to advance sustainable healthcare and influence public policy. And again, we've seen some fantastic examples of that from our speakers um, in Ireland, in the UK and, and in Germany. So we've been thinking about this at Healthcare Without Harm and wondering what we can do to support some of this work, to uh, scale up some of the work happening at a national level um, and to leverage it as well. And um, the, we're going to launch this uh, network called uh, Doctors for Greener Healthcare. And uh, this will be a network that we're um, pulling together to um, to collaborate, to, to, to build, a, again, a, a pan-European network to, to scale up this work, to share best practice, uh, like we're doing in this session today, and to, to share ideas and what we can do, uh, and to advocate for a healthy future by reducing the environmental impact of healthcare. And there are some key opportunities that I suppose we can, um, we can capitalize upon a, at a European and a global level, such as around the COP at Healthcare Without Harm. So this is why we're uh, building this network and, uh, and what we're hoping to do with it. And I suppose our role in all of this then will be uh, providing platforms for clinicians um, all over Europe. So we, uh, as a starting point, we're going to have, you know, build a mailing list uh, whereby uh, clinicians in different countries can share ideas like we're doing today, but on a, on a more daily basis. We'll also be setting up a, a telegram group where uh, we can share information and ideas as well and have a, a quarterly newsletter to, uh, to do uh, the same. 
We'll also be giving some, uh, I suppose, guidance, support, and advice. Again, taking some of the ideas um, um, uh, uh, from the the the, 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 the uh, presentations we've had today, um, doing some research and, and showing what best practice looks like, uh, talking to members of the group, figuring out where bottlenecks lie, where they're having trouble, reaching out to the wider network and seeing where people have overcome these, uh, these uh, problems before and sharing that information. We'll also be providing training to clinicians. Again, uh, this uh, builds on, on the work that's that's been done in the UK and in Germany in particular around uh, training in terms of how to talk to journalists and how to put uh, uh, health-related messages uh, with regard to climate change, for example, uh, into the public consciousness and really shift the dial from uh, thinking about uh, issues like climate change as environmental issues to, to thinking about them and reframing them as um, environmental issues, which are as health issues, excuse me, which is uh, something you know uh, we know we need to do and will it be much more powerful and have much more impact. We'll also be providing a number of tools and resources. We've been doing this for the last number of years, but we, I suppose, will make a more consolidated effort to build some tools and resources for clinicians in particular um, that will be aimed um, at clinicians and developed uh, in consultation with clinicians all over Europe, again, to um, to take that, that, that I suppose, helicopter view as, as to um, best practice in different regions and what's happening in different countries and, uh, and, and put that together uh, in, in an accessible way for people. So again, some of the benefits for members who might like to join this uh, network then, obviously it'd be uh, um, a chance to, to, to get some knowledge and skills to succeed as leaders, um, both inside and outside of, of your hospital or practice setting. The theme of this year's uh, CLEMED conference is uh, leadership for sustainable healthcare. And we know that leadership happens at all levels, it's not just CEOs, it can happen um, you know, uh, um, amongst uh, um, sustainability uh, staff within hospitals, estates and facilities. Um, uh, you know, cleaners have a role to play, um, uh, catering services have a role to play and leadership can happen at all these, these different levels and uh, we're building this network to support clinicians and being leaders within their um, organizations as well. Um, again, we'll have uh, some proven strategies uh, for building sustainable healthcare operations based on best practice from, from around the network. We'll be developing some tools and resources to support uh, sustainability uh, activities and projects. We will, um, again, try to leverage opportunities for advocacy at a global and, and at a European and global level in particular. Um, again, I, I think a lot of this is about sharing ideas and getting inspiration from one another. And we want to create a platform for, you, for clinicians around Europe to be able to do this. Um, and then there'll be... I think opportunities to, to shape conferences like this one, to shape climate conferences and other healthcare without harm Europe conferences and events. I think our constituents and our kind of audience so since um, for the last 10 years or so uh, that we've been working on sustainable healthcare in Europe has been at a hospital level. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to um, engage with clinicians everywhere. And we'd really like conferences such as CLEMED and other events that we run to reflect this and to involve uh, more clinicians. And I think, I think this network is a really opportune way for us to be able to do that. And finally, then just, I suppose, who we're looking for to join this network. Um, and membership will be open to individual doctors and, and medical students. Um, again, we have a membership structure called Global Green and Healthy Hospitals that many of you will be aware of. But uh, for this network, it will not be linked to your, you know, your employer or whatever professional body or university uh, you're involved in. You can join as an individual doctor and engage with the network, I suppose, uh, as much or as little as, as you like. Um, it'll really be based on an individual commitment to the goals of healthcare without harm, harm Europe and a uh, desire to participate in helping to achieve them. And again, our overarching goals are to, to transform healthcare worldwide so it be, reduces its environmental footprint and becomes a, a, a driver for positive change. 
Uh, and I suppose just more practically than what we'll be asking uh, uh, members to provide is uh, their, their registration number, which will be published in your office or the name of their employer, but just to verify, you know, that, that they are in fact clinicians and again, same for medical students. And we have a, um, a registration form that you can access here that I think uh, Maria will um, pop in the uh, chat box as well if she hasn't already done so. So again, really like to invite everybody to, to share this with your networks, um, inviting our, our panelists today. Obviously, we'd really like to work with um, with all of you and your networks in across Ireland, the UK, and Germany to to, to build this network to um, to connect some of the dots here because there's all this amazing work happening um, in different countries uh, around Europe and around the world. And and uh, I think the role that healthcare with harm can play is, um, I suppose, connecting some of these dots and uh, again, sharing some of this best practice and ideas. Um, so that's pretty much it for our session today and for uh, our day sessions at Clean Med and for our week sessions at Clean Med. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. I'd like to thank all of our attendees as well for all of their comments and questions and suggestions. Please let's continue the conversation on Whova. Um, the uh, questions and the chat will be there uh, after the session is, has, has finished and even after the conference has finished for a number of months. So I'd really like to encourage everybody to get on there and, and continue the conversation. The last thing I'd like to do is just, uh, I suppose, highlight some of the upcoming sessions we have um, at CleanMed. So um, this is the last session of the day today and of the week, as I've said. On Monday, we'll be starting at uh, uh, 12 um, Central European time with a session on zero waste in circular healthcare. Uh, my colleague, Maria, has uh, been helpfully um, uh, popping messages in the chat all session. We'll be running a session at uh, three o'clock on Monday, looking at how clinicians can reduce the environmental impact of healthcare. We'll have two speakers um, from uh, the US who are going to talk about how they've built their clinicians network there and some of the work they've been doing, again, within their hospitals, but also at a state and a, a federal level. So it's really interesting, uh, more ideas uh, and inspiration to, to be had there as well. So would like to uh, highlight that one in particular and encourage you all to join. And then on Tuesday, we'll have three more sessions. We'll have one at 10 a.m., uh, which is about growing food for healthcare, one at 12 about reducing pharmaceutical waste and improving access to medicine. And uh, finally, at 3 p.m. Uh, Central European time, one on leadership for a carbon net zero health system and how we can work not just as hospitals, both uh, with suppliers, um, with health professionals, um, how we can take a joint up approach and a collaborative approach to uh, developing and implementing a net zero health system. And uh, very, very finally, I'd just like to uh, say uh, um, thank you to, I suppose, all the sponsors of CleanBed, but also to our funders at Healthcare Without Harm Europe, in particular, the uh, European Commission's LIFE program has funded a lot of the work uh, we have been able to do. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I'll just say thank you very much to uh, all of our speakers again, to uh, Rachel, to Anna, um, to Rita, to Marlena, to uh, Reinhardt and Felix for your time today. I think it's uh, been a, a really fascinating session. I've learned a lot, uh, judging by the comments and, and questions we've had. Our uh, attendees have found it uh, really, really interesting as well. So. Um, Thank you very much. And yeah, let's continue the conversation on, on Hoover and uh, have a lovely evening and, uh, and a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.